In the 1880s, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer each acquired a newspaper with a sizable circulation in the primary news market for America, New York City. An all-out circulation war quickly ensued as each tried to drive the other out of business. When the smoke finally cleared, Pulitzer and Hearst had each destroyed their political aspirations, tarnished the reputation of journalism forever, gotten the United States involved in an imperialistic war against Spain for a patently false cause, and invented a byword for the worst which news media in the United States has to offer. Yellow journalism. This episode might have been just another semi-interesting history lesson, except that I've been looking at the news media, both legacy and online, and I'm afraid that yellow journalism is alive and well. We just call it fake news now. Which means, of course, that I think we should talk about it and realize just how far-reaching this problem has become, according to my roasted opinions, at least. Yellow journalism, or tabloid journalism as it is known in Great Britain, was a particularly insidious and destructive form of reporting. Sensationalized, lurid, and manipulative by its very nature, this kind of journalism redefined the ethics of reporting by providing an example of what not to do. In point of fact, the Society of Professional Journalists first published a code of journalistic ethics in 1926 in no small part because of yellow journalism. Here's the link to that code. I'll post it down in the description, too. Everyone familiar with the history of American journalism knows all about yellow journalism. On the whole, most Americans recognize the term even if they don't know the history of Hearst, Pulitzer, and how their circulation war was a direct cause of the Spanish-American War. To understand exactly what yellow journalism is, though, we need to cover the characteristics of classic yellow journalism. As defined by Professor Frank Mott, the first expert in the history of American journalism, they are 1. Scare headlines in huge print, often of minor news. 2. The lavish use of pictures or imaginary drawings. 3. The use of faked interviews, misleading headlines, pseudoscience, and a parade of false learning from so-called experts. 4. An emphasis on full-color Sunday supplements, usually including comic strips. 5. A dramatic sympathy with the underdog against the system. Scare headlines are headlines designed to provoke a negative emotional response. The huge print was a key feature of these headlines as it allowed passers-by to see the headlines from a distance as a form of advertising for the paper. Every issue from a newspaper which used this tactic has such an over-the-top headline. During the heyday of yellow journalism, illiteracy was still fairly common. Pictures helped to pull even the illiterate into the newsstand to buy a paper, as did drawings which illustrated the events as reported in the story. This is where the term imaginary comes into effect, because the drawings depicted the images of the story as reported, not necessarily with any degree of accuracy as to what actually happened. Here is a classic example of this the illustration of the explosion of the USS Maine. Notice, towards the front of the ship, how the explosion in the drawing originates from outside of the hull of the ship, as if the Maine was torpedoed or mined. We now know from scientific surveys of the evidence that the explosion most likely initiated inside the coal bunkers and spread to the powder stores, detonating about five tons of powder charges and blowing the forward third of the ship apart. That means that the picture of the destruction of the main, as it was run in the newspapers at the time, was wrong. These reports often used fake interviews with supposed eyewitnesses to the events. Because their source eyewitnesses were imaginary, the journalists could report that the eyewitnesses had seen whatever they wished. They would often also use misleading headlines, which bore little resemblance to the contents of the story referenced popular pseudoscience in their reports, and would ask self-declared, uncredentialed, so-called experts to comment on a story. The newspapers in question often printed a special supplement for Sunday editions containing more articles, comic strips, and other illustrations. 
The idea was to appeal to children who often wanted to read the comic strips or funny pages as they became known colloquially. The supplement justified charging a higher rate for the Sunday edition of the paper, a tradition which does continue for most Sunday newspapers to this day. The ads that run in Sunday newspapers also cost more, because more people buy these larger supplemented editions. The final element involved, as identified by Mott, was the dramatic sympathy for the quote-unquote underdog. Both Hearst's New York Journal and Pulitzer's New York World were sold for a penny per copy and were marketed directly to the working class, including immigrants during the height of mass immigration at the end of the 19th century. Their subscriber base was struggling financially and felt oppressed, and Hearst and Pulitzer both prided themselves on their support for the causes of low-income families. These appeals to populism and the common man drew a huge circulation as their subscribers readily identified with the subjects of such reporting. Now far be it from me to criticize F.L. Mott, he was a professor of journalism at Simpson College in Iowa, and one of the best journalistic historians ever. I would add two additional elements which identify yellow journalism to his list, though. Hypocrisy and the intermingling of good reporting on serious issues with the bad reporting that ran every day. As for hypocrisy, Hearst was supposedly an ardent supporter of the common man against big business in the era of trust busting, who owned dozens of major newspapers all over the United States, built a nationwide media company which survives to this day as Hearst Communications, and served as the inspiration for the character of Charles Foster Kane from Orson Welles' classic movie, Citizen Kane. So ludicrous was Hearst's behavior at times that people didn't believe that it was real. Joseph Pulitzer, meanwhile, rested his reputation on being a champion for the common man, and yet was known for having an extremely contentious and backbiting newsroom which he encouraged actively. Journalists who worked for Pulitzer were often paid based on the amount of their work which ran in the paper, and competed directly with each other to get more space and better placement, or even printed at all. He was an opponent of big business who ran the largest paper by circulation in the U.S. at the time. Pulitzer and Hearst, together, provoked the newsboys' strike of 1899 because they refused to pay the children who sold and delivered the papers a fair wage, and both became ludicrously rich for news publishers at the time. And as for the intermingling of good reporting with the bad, Pulitzer is the man who hired Nellie Bly who practically invented modern investigative journalism with her expose on mental asylums, and Richard Outcalt, one of the key pioneers in comic strips. Hearst, for his part, when he was running a paper in San Francisco, employed Mark Twain, Ambrose Bierce, and Jack London, who would all three go on to great success as writers, and Homer Davenport, a genius in political cartoons. Hearst was also known to hire some of Pulitzer's best talent, like Outcult, away from him after they soured on Pulitzer's management style. Those top quality talents leavened the rest of the reporting by fostering an air of legitimacy for the papers. Why rehash all of this, though? Well, this style of journalism is widely considered to be unethical. The reaction to yellow journalism contributed to the first version of the Journalistic Code of Ethics in America. That code, occasionally updated, is still in effect today, and largely ignored by modern journalists. You heard me right. Ignored. It's ignored by professional journalists and legacy media outlets, and ignored by independent journalists, commentators, and influencers in social media. Yellow journalism is the new unofficial standard for all journalism. Hey, Roast? Um, no. Just, no. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I'll prove it. Here are some examples of scare headlines in huge print, often about minor news. These headlines are designed to provoke an emotional response so that even if the content attached to them isn't consumed, they still get shared and still generate circulation for their publishers. Here are examples of the lavish use of pictures and imaginary drawings. Note how they take up space on the page conveying less detailed information in print and more imagery and feelings. The pictures and images inform the reader on a subconscious level of how they are supposed to feel about a situation, 
and do so quite successfully. These are legacy media examples, but social media doesn't get a pass on this. They just have a different take on it and a different name. Clickbait. Clickbait drives views, and views drive subs, and both of these drive advertising. Well, what about that third characteristic? Legacy journalists don't use fake interviews anymore. They use credentialed experts and discuss scientific issues on which there is scientific consensus. Right? Journalists don't use fake interviews anymore, true. But thanks to the impact of Deep Throat in the Washington Post's Watergate expose, anonymous sources are perfectly acceptable. There is even a provision in the Journalistic Code of Ethics to allow the protection of the identity of sources if it will cause the source harm. And this is codified in U.S. law as well. The problem is that all of these articles which are depicted in this segment have sources who spoke only under the condition of anonymity. While there are times when actual whistleblowers need that protection, there's still a compelling reason to identify sources whenever possible so that the validity of the information supplied by those sources may be considered by the readers. If the information is about a scandalous act by a politician, and the source of that information is the chief of staff for that politician's opponent, does the information seem as valid? And should it? As for pseudoscience, well, that's all over the media these days, isn't it? And as for those experts, credentialed people commenting on issues in their field is one thing, but when the expertise is granted by their membership in and or affiliation with an advocacy group, Well, perhaps those experts aren't objectively evaluating the situation. Professors of social theory and political science are certainly credentialed experts, but only in social theory and political science. In other fields, they are lay people until and unless they obtain further accreditation in that field. Doctors are presented as medical experts without paying any attention to their specialty or the fact that a clinical oncologist might not be an expert in Parkinson's disease nor qualified to diagnose mental illness. And as for misleading headlines, well, clickbait. The emphasis on full-color Sunday supplements filled with comic strips would seem to be a newspaper-specific problem. In modern terms, the equivalent is marketed as a special report or an in-depth investigation. They also encompass the vast majority of news commentary shows and their agenda-driven content. In social media, this is special episodes by independent channels and short-notice live streams on many channels. And as for Mott's fifth defining characteristic of yellow journalism, well, we don't call them underdogs as much these days as we call them identity groups. Everything from men's rights groups to intersectional feminists, flat earthers to climate change deniers, They're all advocates, and those advocates commonly present the group they support as an underdog in modern society. Media outlets, both legacy and social, have all contributed to a massive brawl of underdogs. Hypocrisy has spread throughout the media. Everywhere we look, we can see examples of, don't do this, but it's okay when I do it. If accused, deny. If the accusation is proven, don't apologize. If someone else apologizes, well, that's just not good enough, is it? As I expected, I have to say, not all. There is some really good journalism out there, in both legacy and social medias, and some really good journalists. They leaven the rest with their accurate, balanced reporting which adheres much more closely to journalistic ethics. There are also journalists and content creators out there who produce truly spectacular, well-made pieces every once in a while lending an air of legitimacy to their normally overtly biased, agenda-driven, clickbait content. It seems in the overall analysis that yellow journalism is the norm these days. It's expected from both legacy outlet journalists and independent creators who work in news and commentary. This is how we beat the algorithms and go viral, and we really can't claim that this is for a better reason than the motivations behind Hearst and Pulitzer. Now can we? We are all after more circulation in the form of views and subscribers so that we can get more and better advertising placed on our content. Fox News is after more ads, and CNN, and the New York Times, and USA Today, and all the rest of the legacy outlets. But so too are channels all over social media, independent creators who have made it to monetization levels 
want to build up enough income from their channels to become full-time creators. And smaller creators are trying to reach monetization so that they can get paid for the many hours that they put into their content. It's just business, right? Especially since the legacy media outlets have spotted the writing on the wall and are starting to take over spaces like YouTube. Now, I don't believe that independent news and commentary creators can compete with legacy news media in the long run by playing the same game. I also don't think that the way the game is played these days is good, because yellow journalism is just as vile now as it was 120 years ago. We need to be better than this, because we owe it to our audiences to be better. Commentary channels have an audience because people want to know what we have to say about things. If we truly want to be worth watching, then we need to be familiar with the journalism code of ethics ourselves. The shock and drama content might pull people in, but in the long run our audiences will tire of shock and drama, and the platforms we use will tire of dealing with endless complaints against an independent creator who supplies them with very little content which can be monetized due to all of that shock and drama. The channel will eventually disappear, whether by the audience disappearing or because the platform decides to terminate the channel. And who knows? Maybe if we can produce better content, then we will pull in that audience growth as more people realize that they can trust our reporting to be factually accurate, properly sourced, and with our opinions and personal biases clearly defined as such. It could eventually pull the majority of news media out of the fake news cycle. Yellow journalism is alive and well in the form of fake news, and it's going to be up to us to do something about it. Now there I go again with my pipe dreams about improving things for all of us. When will I learn? If you have something to say about this, that's fine. Go ahead and post your comments. Feel free to like or dislike this video and share it with others. Take a look at the channels I've listed on the end screen too, because they have content which I enjoy even if I don't agree with them all the time.